happening is, uh, is a really great event to go to, not because it's a really great event, but it gives you and me an opportunity to engage in our community. Uh, we've been talking here about how different values that we have, we know God, live family, and people, and really, uh, they're providing the space and the platform for you and I to go reach lost people. Beautiful. Many times I feel like the church gets mis mixed up, and especially small churches like ours, uh, where we uh, we end up trying to put on this big event for the community, and then all you and I do is spend all this time putting on this event, and we don't spend any time reaching lost people. And um, and most of the time, guess what? Someone who doesn't know Jesus, guess what they're not going to do? They're not coming to a church event. Okay? They're going to go to an event like this. And now where you and I get the beautiful opportunity to step into that world, start to make some friends. And so if you're from Tom's River, uh, which this is right by my house, um, I'm going to be there. And so I hope to see you there too. It would be a great opportunity for us to really uh, reach some lost people, or reach people in general, uh, whether they're church or unchurched. Uh, so, hey, I'm going to open just in a word of prayer. Uh, we're going to go into John chapter 13, if you want to open your Bible there. Um, and we're going to take a look at this text. God, I just pray that we would hope, we would, we would, we would picture this text or this scene and really walk away with something tangible here today that we could really understand more of what your intentions were even at this in John chapter 13. Uh, God, we just don't want to read your word. We just know it. But, you know, it was a, an encounter that I had here years ago. Um, we were like a really young church uh, before these chairs were here. Uh, and we had some other chairs that we ended up, uh, they were gray chairs, and they got really stained over the years, by the way. And um, I remember when I went with my, my the founding pastor of this church, Pastor Bob, and we went and picked them up from someone that was giving it to us. Because the chairs that existed here before, before that, with these red, ugly, these really ugly chairs, okay? And, um, and we went and picked them up, and it was me and uh, the pastor, the senior pastor, and we both looked at each other, and we're like, we're carrying all these chairs, there's like a hundred chairs, and we're bringing them through the building, and we were a growing church at the time, I don't know, we might have been like 60 people, we were smaller than this, and we would always dream. Pastor Bob would dream, and I would dream, and I would love to dream with him, and I would love to see, like, the work that God is one day going to do. We had plans, by the way, guys. We had plans, like airfields and stuff like that. We had soccer fields, big buildings, massive buildings. And, um, but as we're carrying these hundred chairs, like, now, now please know, there's, like, two guys, you, you, you put them in the, in the truck, and you, you take them out of the truck, and then you bring them here to the church, and you set them up in the you got to get rid of the old chairs. It was a long day of hard work. And I remember we said to one another, one day, it's not going to be like this. One day, someone else is going to be carrying the chairs. No, I'm being honest. That's what exactly, that's not a joke. I don't know if you guys are laughing at because you're just recognizing. That, but for real, that's what we wanted. Like, I want to tell you some nasty desires of pastors. Fine. Is, um, is that one day, um, like I'm the pastor, I don't have to do the cleaning of the church. And I'm the pastor, so I don't have to stack the chairs. And I'm the pastor, so I'm going to focus on the word, and I'm not going to serve at all in any capacity. It's really cool, um, counter a few weeks ago, I, I had my daughter softball team, so I came late for the church cleanup day, and there was our two pastors um, cleaning the church, serving our 
me serving us, with, along with a whole bunch of other guys. But I want to just tell you, like, when, when you're going to like school for this stuff, like, and many people could probably agree to this or understand this, there's like this image that's almost presented as like the role of the pastor. Now there's there's a role for shepherding and teaching and pastoring and teaching the word and equipping God's people for works of service, but about to go into a text today that I think puts all that on its head for us and starts to hopefully help us all understand and really teach us something really important, not just for pastors, but for communities in general. And because I think sometimes we can miss it. We sometimes think that it's somebody else's job. I'm not bragging about myself, it's not to brag, but I can easily get frustrated when I'm the last one in the building and I'm cleaning the sink and the dishes are that way. Someone's got to do it. Who does it? So I'll stick around and do it. And 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 this is the rea- this is a reality though. As I'm cleaning the dishes, I'm getting angry at some of you, by the way. Okay? Like, well, how could you leave the dishes? I can't believe they left the dishes there, you know, and I'm getting all angry. And... But this is, this is the, sometimes the evilness that lurks within. It's like thinking that I'm privileged in some way, that I don't have to do it. Is that what Jesus taught us? No, right? Let's look at John chapter 13, because I'm, I'm going to show you how what he taught us and how he demonstrated for us. Many of you might know this. This is uh, Jesus titled, Jesus Washes His Disciples' Feet. And I'm going to pull out a few portions of Scripture and just kind of uh, look at them a little deeper for us. I'm going to just read from verses 1 to 20 and then 34 to 35. It was just before the uh, Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to come, go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and a devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had to come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped the towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. It came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you are not going to wash my feet. Or, or he said it more as a question. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing. But later you will understand. No said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, 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 Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have been bathed need not only to wash their feet, their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set this as an example so that you would do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you. I know I know those who have, I, I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Um, for it has happened, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. 
whoever accepts anyone, I sent accepts me. And whoever accepts me, accepts the one I sent me. Verse 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. We'll take a look at verse 4 a little more. But um, Jesus does something so different here. Um, he gets down and washes their feet. And that picture, uh, we just have to really dive into that a little deeper. And i got to set the scene a little more. Um, in Luke chapter 22, it's actually uh, Luke records that there was actually a fight kind of going on, disagreement amongst the disciples. And the fight was, um, who was going to be the greatest? And so when they looked at one another, they're fighting, and they're sitting at dinner, and this is like 24 hours left of Jesus' life. 20, within 24 hours, he's going to be crucified on the cross. This is the last 24 hours of his life. He's just spent three years with these guys. He spent all this time investing in them and investing in them, pouring himself out to them. And he, and he realizes this. Jesus realizes the time has come for him to be be. The Father has made this time known to him. And Jesus now has 24 hours left. And he's sitting in a room, in this upper room, this, this, this room where they're about to take part in the Passover meal. And they're about to have a meal together. And his disciples are fighting over whether or not who is the greatest among them. Now, if you want, if you're training people, 12 people, to go and change the landscape of the world, okay, and they're fighting over who's the best, like, Jesus, we obviously know this story, they got something wrong here, those disciples. They got something really wrong. And Jesus, I want to tell you, if I was Jesus in that moment, I would have just said a simple prayer to God and been like, God, I need one more year. Like, one more year, Father. Just one more. I, just put, put a pin in this right now, and we'll come back to this next year, next Passover. Like, that would have been my attitude. Or I would have, I would have lost it. Okay? I would, have been, I would have been flipping tables at my disciples. Are you serious? I have 24 hours to live, and you're fighting over who's the greatest? Have you listened to me one bit? They didn't listen. That's, okay, when you just say the same thing over and over and over again, and it listen. So, like, this is what Jesus is sitting here with, and he sees, he's watching the scene of his disciples just arguing who is going to be the greatest. And Jesus does something really different. He actually takes, he takes off his outer garment, and he puts a towel around his and he gets on his hands and knees, and he starts to wash the disciples' feet. Now, it may not mean anything to me and you, because we wear sneakers and shoes all day, okay? But back then, they wore these sandals, these open-toed sandals. You ever seen summer that are, like, wearing the open sandals, and they're playing in the dirt, and those feet look, whoo, boy. Like, I'm not coming near those feet. You know, I don't want those feet in my house. Do you know what I mean? And so you better put some socks and shoes before you walk in my living room. And so th this is kind of what they were like. Their feet were white, but just way worse, okay? Because this is all they wore. They had open foot sandals. And all throughout the streets, you had animals traveling through the streets. You had um, things kicking up on their shoes. And so what they did was at every home, usually, when you walk in the home, there was like this bowl of water and a towel and it was given to what they call the lowliest servant, okay, for them to wash somebody, their feet when they came in. Now, when I read this, I automatically go, oh, okay, who's the lowliest one? All right, let's pick somebody, Doubting Thomas. Thomas, Thomas is the one to wash everybody's feet today, guys. Like, that's what my mind goes to, like the lowest one. Who was picked last? You know, I got, I got tenure here, you know what I mean? So whoever was picked last out of Jesus is 12. But it's not like that. It wasn't even like that Jesus, like it was like a Jewish person sitting at the door. It was a Gentile slave. Someone that would 
is so disgusting and defiled. Like they would defile the temple if they came even closer into that inner inner uh, into the temple any farther than what the Gentile courts would allow. Gentiles were the ones that washed these the chosen people's feet, and it wasn't just a Gentile. Okay, it was a slave. And now Jesus is doing something as they're fighting of who's going to be the greatest. Guess what role Jesus chooses? He chooses the role of a slave. He gets down on his hands and knees and he serves his disciples. He's trying to teach them a lesson. He's trying to say, hey guys, you missed it when you walked in the door. When one of you should have stepped down and served one of us. Instead, hey, how about this? I. God will serve you. Because it's not like that it wasn't made known to them. It wasn't like they weren't following him for three years, thinking and knowing that this is the Son of Man. Instead, Jesus, God himself, got on his knees and served them. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. I'm sure, I don't know if any of you have had your feet washed, um, but I had a very humbling experience one time with my feet being washed. Now, I got some gnarly feet, I'll just be honest with you. Okay? I'm so embarrassed by them. Okay? I don't know how it happened. It just happened. I'm going to call it genetics, all right? And, um, when I got ordained as a pastor, um, it was like a very humbling experience because what they were saying to me is like, you, you, you with ordination, they say the ministry is no longer on like the church or like the church that you belong to as you fall underneath that authority. Instead, you are separated from that. And now the authority comes upon you. At that moment, when it was Pastor Chris and Laura, a lot of the leaders of our, t- uh, the elders that were here beforehand, and my pastor, Pastor Bob, the founding pastor of this church, the man who discipled me and trained me and taught me and led me for so many years, guess what he did? He got down on his hands and knees, and he washed the pupil. Like, he served me. That didn't make sense to me. And I started to, I did something that I didn't realize I was going to do at the moment. And I I ended up, I ended up bawling, crying. And then I put my cheek against his cheek. Now that seems kind of weird to some of you. Okay, I don't, I don't care. But at that moment, I had this very intimate moment with my pastor because I realized at that moment, he was stepping into my most dirtiest place and serving me. He was stepping in to a very intimate place and serving me. He was willing to love me on his hands and knees by washing my feet. And I really struggled with it. And what I realized is this. Jesus is stepping into their most vulnerable, dirtiest places at this moment. And Jesus is demonstrating something for us and saying this to simply us. He wants to step into your most vulnerable and dirty areas and watch your feet. Some of us just need to be coming before the Lord, be a little vulnerable. To be honest, Jesus, my my feet are gnarly. I'm not talking about feet anymore some areas in our life that are pretty gnarly. They're pretty dirty. Which brings me to my second point. Jesus wants to step into those places and serve you. Jesus wants to serve you. Now look what happens later in the text. A few verses later. Peter, Simon Peter. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Like, this is crazy to Peter. You, no way. 
There's no way God, my master, my Lord, could wash my gnarly feet. There's no way I'm going to let you do that. Jesus replies, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Jesus is even foreshadowing, he's speaking toward the cross and the work that Jesus is about to do within 24 hours. He says, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now listen to what Peter says right here. He says, he says, or listen to what Jesus says. He goes, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You have no part. Other versions say you have no share with me. You have no part with me unless I do what? Wash you. And so a lot of times we think that we need to just come to Jesus. And, and, and let, me, let me just back up real quick. I want you to understand this, that Jesus is saying this simple story to Peter. Let me serve you, Peter. And if you don't let me serve you, I, you have no part with me. Here's a simple way that Jesus served us, right? He served us through the cross. He did something that we could not do in and of ourselves. He died for the sins of the world on the cross. He served us to redeem us, to rescue us, to bring us near to him. He saved us. He served us on the cross with his arms spread wide, his blood The blood that poured out from him, he died for the sin of the world. Your past, present, and future sins that you will mess up sometime on the way you leave here or sometime after here today. He died for every single one of your sins, and he died for them by serving us. But here's the big problem. We're all willing to accept that story if you know Jesus. If you've allowed Jesus to become your Lord and Savior, and you said, Jesus, I will follow you, I will follow you, you are my God, and I will follow you. I confess my sin before you. The problem is that you and I will go about the rest of our life and not allowing Jesus to serve us. Now let me tell you what I mean. So many of us are just too darn prideful. And we will accept the story of the cross of Jesus serving us, but we won't allow Jesus into all of these other areas of our life. Or we'll ask, we'll basically fight with God and have a discussion with him about every time, uh, or every time we're coming faced with conflict in, in our life in some way, as a, a dad or a husband, every time we feel bad, I feel down, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm missing something, Guess what I'm going to do? I'm not as bad as that person. And I'm not as bad as a husband as that person. And I'm going to start comparing myself to other people and justify my relationship with my son or my daughter or my wife based upon what I see other people living. And I will justify those those things that are out of balance, those things that are pretty gnarly in my life. Every time a woman turns to the YouTube or the magazines or some motivational speaker to make themselves, their image feel good, you're justifying this thing in our life rather than allowing Jesus to serve you. Every time we strive to add to our image in some way, the way we look on our resume, the way we look according to other people, every time that we try to create some type of, pre- some type of presentation to a world, rather than just finding and being washed in who Jesus says I am, I'm not allowing Jesus to serve me. Every time you know the story of your life or the plan for your life or the American dream life that you want to live out, every time you and I buy into that story, we're not allowing Jesus to serve us. 
Jesus wants to serve us in the most deepest and most intimate ways. Every time we are frustrated with our past dreams, our, 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 our hopes, every time we are trying to find, whittle, uh, like find a, a way out of the situation that we're in other than Christ, we're finding something else to serve other than allowing Jesus to serve us. I wanted to get a deeper picture of this because what I'm trying to say is this, that there are so many things in the world that you and I turn to other than Jesus to serve us. What is that thing in your life? What have you not allowed Jesus into that deepest, darkest, most intimate place in your life? That's a scary truth. Because we love this story on the cross. Jesus, I don't want you to watch that. So watch that. This whole conversation with Jesus is a major tension here in this conversation we're seeing. And, and Jesus is clarifying, because Peter's the big, he's like, oh, well, not much of my feet. I want all of it, Lord. He's like, well, hey, if you already know me, if you're already saved, if salvation has come to you, and you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, let me clarify that, is the master of your life. If you believe that, then you don't need a bath. You just need to wash your feet. But let me simplify this for us even more. All Jesus wants you and I to do is simply repent. 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 Just say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, for I do not know the ways that I'm going. And when we repent, repentance is more like, I'm going to give you another Bible verse, just a famous, uh, one that I hold on to often and say and repeat over and over again. And some of you are going to be like, hey, Pastor Joe, can you give me a better one? But that's a really simple one. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. When I repent, I am putting all of my trust upon him. I am taking a position of a vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable place. And I'm saying, Jesus, you hush. I'm trusting you right now. I'm trusting you right now. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Repentance is the key to you, our life of understanding how Jesus can serve you today. Some of us don't want to serve us. He wants to. He wanted to so much that he died for you. But when he was done, let's look at verse 12. When he was done, finished washing their feet, put on clothes, and returned, put on his clothes and returned to his place. He said, do you understand what I've done for you? Call me teacher and Lord. Rightfully so. That is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set an example so that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is, any, is, is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, be blessed. Jesus modeled he modeled it. He set an example for us in it. We can look at Philippians chapter 2 if we want to see what the life of Jesus looked like, what, what, what someone with a Christ-like character looks like, someone that is really trying to go after Jesus should look like 
Philippians chapter 2, or should, we should understand that this is who Jesus is calling us to be like. Um, being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself equality with God as something to be grasped, to his, uh, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, this is where we need to check in, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. He humbled himself for me and you by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, do you understand what Jesus has done for you? Sometimes I don't know if we do. I've got to be honest with you. Like, this is just, again, my, my heart. Just be honest. Like, sometimes I don't think we get it. But I don't get it. If I don't get it, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sure we don't get it either, too. I know Pastor Chris, he sometimes misses it, too. And Pastor Frank, we talk about this all the time. We don't get it. We don't really fully grasp what Jesus has done for us and what he's calling us to do. I've set an example for you so that you would do as I have done for you. So what Jesus did here was a, a self-denying, sacrificial love for his disciples, taking on a position of the lowest person. Are we called to love like this? Can I be honest with you? The term that flew around my house a lot is like, I don't have to love like Jesus because he did it for me. Not, not me, my house today, by the way. But growing up, Jesus did the work for me on the cross. Yes, he did. But he still calls us to love like the cross. He says even take up your cross and follow me in Luke chapter 9. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. You got to lose it. You got to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Hey, guess what? The story isn't good for us. I'm sorry you got a bad message when you, when you first turned to Christ. But the message is this, life is not going to be better. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Life is hard, but we believe in a good God. And, and so this is something that we need to grasp, but that, that, as a Christian, it doesn't give us permission or liberty or some type of privilege to step above and beyond the service that God is calling us to. He's calling us to love even when it hurts. He's calling us to love even when we don't want to. He's calling us to love even when our emotions scream, no! He's calling us to love. And this ain't no fuzzy wuzzy love like, I love the Yankees, I love burgers, and I love my wife. This is a dying love. This is a, a you deny yourself love. This is a love that, like, you no longer exist. It's not about you. And I'm sorry someone told you it's all about you. But here's the beauty. I don't want this to be a bit Debbie Downer the whole time, right? Or else nobody's coming back next week. What happens with that love? When we really love like that, what happens with that? It says in verse 17, now that you know these things, you will be blessed. And let me, let me just clarify that real quick. It doesn't mean you're going to have a lot of money. Okay? It doesn't mean your relationships are going to get better. It doesn't mean everybody's going to love you. It just simply means you're blessed. What are you and I blessed with? Him. Him. Just him. Finally experiencing what it looks like to really be like and follow Jesus. You get to experience him. 
We, we also threw this verse out a while ago, and I want to tell you this is a verse I've been repeating to myself, and then I'll close up here. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul was really wrestling with his life, and wrestling with the, what God was doing, and really, but also wrestling this beautiful church that he created, or that, that God that he started up, his church was losing it. And, and he had to go on and boast the way that the people wanted him to boast. And Paul goes that the Lord came to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Really saying this, my presence, God's presence, God's presence is perfect for you. For you. You. Perfect for you. No matter what's going on. No matter if you lost a job. No matter if you're getting wrinkles in places you don't want to get them. No matter what's going on. No matter if all of a sudden every the mortgage is starting to fall behind. No matter what. His presence is sufficient for you. No matter if you and your spouse are struggling. His grace is sufficient for you. No matter if people are cursing you at work, His grace is sufficient. His presence is sufficient for you. And you are still called to love. If I could just remind us of one person that He's also, Jesus is washing. This is how extreme it gets. Jesus is washing whose feet? Judas' feet. The person that betrayed Him, and Jesus knew. Jesus knew. He knew that he was being betrayed. He knew. Guess what he did? He washed, even say, he washed his enemy's feet. That is the life you and I are called to. Sacrifice no matter what. Pastor Chris is going to have a couple weeks in our office.